I spoke yesterday about the part played by the figure of Paul at the beginning of Christianity. Easter is an appropriate occasion for such study, and when we think of the numbers of people in the grip of materialism today who have no real right to celebrate an Easter festival, it is obvious that the subject is also very relevant to the conditions of our time. A true Easter impulse needs to permeate Europe, and indeed the whole civilized world, whose present decline and decadence will otherwise continue unabated. At Easter it is fitting that we remember the form in which Christianity first made its appearance in the world. It is necessary, especially nowadays, for us to realize how far people have come adrift from any real understanding of the Christ impulse and how closely this lack of understanding is connected with the symptoms of decline in evidence at the present time. These symptoms show themselves clearly in the utterances of often well-intentioned individuals. In the title Basel News yesterday, you may have read a striking but at the same time saddening article which included the text of a letter from northwest Germany. The writer of the letter, with whom the author of the article seems to some extent to agree, emphasizes that the universal tendency of the day is to prepare for the destruction of the old without putting anything new in its place, that on all sides, right and left, people are succumbing almost eagerly to illusions. The author of the article himself says that Bolshevism will now spread through Europe and that we must simply wait calmly for its arrival. By a process of natural development, he continues, people will then discover what Bolshevism really is and move forward from it to something better. But then he adds two or three lines which deserve attention, although the cursory reader will overlook them as he overlooks so many things. He writes, quote, It is not the illusions of right or left that must be heeded. Neither should we listen to what individual dreamers say, but detect general tendencies. Close quote. These well-intentioned people are the really difficult ones to deal with. They realize that civilization is going downhill and are always warning most pessimistically against listening to those who make an attempt to better this miserable state of things. But as a matter of fact, they are only representatives of large masses of people who are immediately satisfied whenever some acute crisis is followed by a measure of peace. They are blind to the fact that there is nothing really important about an interval of peace and that the path will inevitably lead downhill until a sufficiently large number of human beings realize that a wave of spiritual renewal must pass over this unhappy Europe. Without this there can be no improvement. It is impossible to make any progress by perpetuating old conditions, and least of all is it possible by means of compromises which infect and spoil the new that is trying to come to expression. To prepare ourselves for the new attitudes of soul which are needed, we can, by looking back, develop a feeling for the powerful way in which individuals like Paul brought something quite new into earth evolution at the turning point of history. At the present time, certainly, such impulses glimmer on, but are concealed as though under a mound of ashes. This turning point divided the old from the new age, although the transition is not noticed because it came about so gradually. When people looked out at nature in olden times, they perceived the divine and spiritual in everything. This perception of the divine and spiritual expressed itself in the views and traditions relating to the social order, to the configuration of life that prevailed among the masses, from whom individuals came forth as rulers, as priestly leaders, we will not at the moment consider how this configuration of the social life was regulated by the mysteries, but it was respected and administered as something bestowed upon man without action on his part, as a natural gift of the Spirit. 
Whoever became leader under the conditions and circumstances of a particular place was recognized and acknowledged by the strength with which the divine spoke through him. Just as the divine and spiritual was seen in stones, in mountains, in water, in trees, so too was it seen in an individual person. In those past times it was a matter of course to regard the ruler as a god, that is to say, as one in whom the Godhead was manifest. If people of the present day were a little humbler and did not project their own opinion upon what they know of ancient usages, those usages would be far better understood. Today, of course, we have no real concept that a man can be a god, but in ancient times there was reality behind it. Just as men saw not merely a flowing stream, but the divine and spiritual astir in it, so did they perceive the sway of the divine in the social life as immediate reality. As time went on, however, this vision of the direct presence of the divine and spiritual grew dimmer and dimmer. Possessing this ancient vision, how did man conceive of his own being? He knew that his being was rooted in the world of the divine and spiritual. He knew that the divine and spiritual is present wherever sense objects, wherever human beings themselves are on the physical earth. He knew that he was born out of the divine and spiritual. Out of God I am born, out of God we are all born. This was a self-evident truth to people in those days, for they beheld its reality. It was the outcome of sensory vision. Such a conviction was no longer within man's immediate reach at the time when knowledge of the divine and spiritual was to be brought to humanity in a new form by the impulse proceeding from the mystery of Golgotha. In ancient times a person could say, quote, Everything I see in the world reveals to me that objects and beings come from the gods that their existence is not enclosed within the limits of earthly life. Close quote. Man was conscious of the eternal nature of his own being, because he knew that he originated from the gods. This apprehension of spiritual existence before birth lay at the very root of the old pagan creeds. The characteristics attributed to pagan beliefs by scholars today are no more than conjectures. The essence of such beliefs, before they fell into decadence, was a knowledge that one had existed before birth as a being of spirit and soul. Therefore, existence was not limited to earthly life. Human beings had the assurance of eternal life, for they came from God, and God would take them to himself again. That ultimately was the knowledge emanating from the ancient primeval wisdom. And it can be said that this knowledge came to the various peoples in the form appropriate to each of them, for it was bound up with innate vision of the divine and spiritual in the things of the world of sense. In ancient times this vision of the divine and spiritual was dependent on the blood, and the particular form in which primeval wisdom came to a person depended on his blood relationship, his racial stock, and his people. The Jewish people alone were an exception, in the sense that although their particular form of the primeval wisdom was bound up with their blood, they regarded themselves as the chosen people, as the people who maintained that their own racial creed embodied the true knowledge of the God of all mankind. Whereas the heathen people round about worshipped their racial divinities, the Jewish people believed their God to be God of all the earth. This was a transitional stage. When Paul appeared with his interpretation of Christianity, there was a fundamental break with the principle whereby human knowledge was determined by the blood, the principle that had prevailed, and necessarily so in earlier times. For Paul was the first to declare that neither blood nor identity of race nor any factor by which human knowledge had been determined in pre-Christian times could remain. 
but that man himself must establish his relation to knowledge through inner initiative, that there must be a community of those whom he designated as Christians, a community to which people would ally themselves in spirit and soul, rather than being placed into it by their blood, one which they would choose to belong to. Paul was well aware of the need to establish this spiritual community on earth, because the time was approaching when mankind's outward earthly knowledge was destined to succumb to materialism. This being so, it was necessary for the human being to receive awareness of his spirit and soul nature from a source other than the physical senses. In olden times it was a matter simply of looking with the eyes, for the spirit and soul in another human being was immediately manifest. This was so no longer. Knowledge of the spirit and soul was to be sought in a different way. In other words, man had to grasp the problem of death, had to learn that what can be seen of the human being here on earth through the senses may perish and disintegrate, but that there is within him an entelechy not immediately perceptible in this physical frame, a being who belongs to the spiritual world. Readers aside, entelechy, E-N-T-E-L-E-C-H-Y, end of readers aside. The bond between people in this community of Christians was not to be dependent on the blood, for the blood as vitalizer and sustainer of that which ends with death could provide no assurance of immortality. Although in ancient times the spirit and soul shone through it, the spirit and soul must be revealed in its essence and purity if the possibility of understanding the problem of death in a non-materialistic way was not to be lost. Paul was able to find the power to speak of a being of spirit and soul not bound to physical matter, only because he had experienced himself experienced this supersensible reality at Damascus. Knowledge of the supersensible, of the spirit and soul, was dependent in olden times on the blood. The blood coursing through the human being itself brought this revelation into the material world. This died away, and it was therefore necessary for human beings to turn to something not dependent on the blood. But there was a great danger here the danger that in the age now dawning man would still be prone to look back into his own being for knowledge of spirit and soul. Formerly this was possible because the blood itself was the bearer of supersensible knowledge. The event of Golgotha enabled people of goodwill to be free of this dependence. But the general trend of evolution was such that for a time people continued the once well-founded habit in regard to the blood. They no longer bore within themselves the blood which reveals the divine, yet they still wanted to understand the divine and spiritual through their own innate attributes. The danger resulting from this consisted in the following, and it is important that this danger should be elucidated. We receive our blood through descent, through birth, When we are 25, 30, 35 years old, we bear this inherited blood within us. We receive our blood through the powers of the universe, which bring us into the world. If the blood contains the guarantee of the existence of spirit and soul, then we can rely upon it to uphold us. However, This blood had gradually lost the power to be the bearer of the divine and spiritual, yet people still went on desiring to find within themselves the way to the divine and spiritual, through the simple fact of having been born. This became less and less possible, for if the blood does not carry into material existence the conviction of the supersensible, the organism itself can promote no relationship with supersensible reality. Human beings came to the point of inquiring into the supersensible by looking to themselves alone, relying upon what comes with them at birth. But Christianity 
summons us not to rely upon what is brought into earthly existence at birth. It summons us to undergo a transformation, to allow the soul to develop, to be reborn in Christ, to acquire through effort and education, through life itself, what is not acquired through the mere fact of birth. This could not be grasped all at once, and it therefore came about that echoes of the old blood wisdom lasted on into the fifteenth century, and even then it remained the custom to relate the divine and spiritual to descent, to heredity, until in the nineteenth century even this glimpse was lost, and man had eyes for the material alone. Because he wanted to perceive the divine and spiritual through his still untransformed physical organism, he lost sight of the spiritual altogether. And so in the nineteenth century there came a severe crisis point. People could no longer recognize the divine and felt forsaken. They became unchristian because a situation which had been concealed for a time under the mantle of tradition now came to the surface. Until the rise of Protestantism, a Christian tradition was still alive. What the apostles, the disciples of the apostles, and the church fathers imparted through teachers who preserved a living tradition was linked with the revelation of Golgotha. But the sustaining power of this tradition steadily diminished. Nor were people able of themselves to reach any true understanding of the event of Golgotha. Then came the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, and connection was lost even with tradition. In the end it was to Scripture alone that a measure of importance was still attached. Protestantism set store by the documents of Scripture. Living tradition had been abandoned. But even a genuine understanding of the Scriptures came to an end in the 19th century. And the fact is that the body of belief professed by the vast majority of those calling themselves Christians today is no longer Christianity. Thus in the 19th century, when the dire need arose to discover the event of Golgotha anew, anti-Christian impulses flared up. These were, of course, always there under the surface, but had for a time been cloaked by tradition and by scripture. They made their way to the surface during the nineteenth century and reached full force in the twentieth, when, for the majority of people, neither scripture nor tradition have importance any longer. But people have also not yet kindled the light, which can lead again to an understanding of the event of Golgotha. To this cause alone are to be attributed the utterly unchristian impulses which laid hold of mankind in the nineteenth century and have persisted into the twentieth. Two of the most unchristian impulses of all are those which took effect in the nineteenth century. The first phenomenon, which came to the fore and gained an even stronger hold over people's minds and emotions, was that of nationalism. Here we see the shadow of the old blood principle. The Christian impulse toward universal humanity was completely overshadowed by the principle of nationalism, because people were as yet unable to find their way to the universally human. The anti-Christian impulse makes its appearance firstly in the form of nationalism, in which the old Luciferic principle of the blood comes to life once more. We see a revolt against Christianity in the nationalism of the nineteenth century, which reached its culmination in Woodrow Wilson's phrase about the self-determination of nations. The one and only reality befitting the present age would be to overcome and eradicate nationalism, and for people to be stirred by the impulse of the universally human. The second phenomenon is that human beings do not seek to draw their knowledge of the world from awakened powers of soul, but from the material image of these powers only. Vision of the soul has faded, 
And although our physical being is an image of the divine and spiritual, this image now brings forth intellectualism, not knowledge of the spirit. A secret of which I have often spoken to you is that we can only recognize and know the spiritual by lifting ourselves to the spirit. Yet the brain is an instrument for purely intellectual apprehension. Intellectualism and materialistic thinking are one and the same. For all the thinking that goes on in science, in theology, in the sphere of modern Christian consciousness, all of it is the product of the human brain alone, is materialistic. This manifests itself, on the one hand, in an empty formalism of belief, on the other, in Bolshevism. Bolshevism owes its destructive power to the fact that it is a product of the brain, pure and simple, of the material brain. I have often described how the material brain really represents a process of decay. Materialistic thinking unfolds only through processes of destruction, death processes, which are taking place in the brain. If this kind of thinking is applied as it is in Leninism and Trotskyism, to the social order, a destructive process is inevitably set in motion. For such ideas issue from what is itself the foundation of destruction, the Aramonic principle. These two impulses of nationalism, the Luciferic form of anti-Christianity, and that which culminated in the tenets of Lenin and Trotsky, the Aramonic form of anti-Christianity, have insinuated themselves into what ought to have been the Christian impulse of the 19th and 20th centuries. Nationalism and Leninism are the shovels with which the grave of Christianity is being dug today. And wherever these principles, even in a mild form, become a creed, the grave of Christianity is being prepared. Those who have insight can discern here a mood that is in a real sense the mood of Easter Saturday. Christianity lies in the grave, over which human beings roll a stone. In truth, two stones have been laid over the grave of Christianity, the stones of nationalism and outward socialism. Humanity needs now to inaugurate the time of Easter Sunday, when the stone or the stones are rolled away. Christianity will not rise from the grave until human beings overcome nationalistic passions and false forms of socialism, until they learn how to find out of themselves the forces that can lead to an understanding of the mystery of Golgotha. When, with the mood of soul prevailing at the present time, people profess belief in Christ, the angel can only give the same answer as was given in the days of the mystery itself. Quote, He whom ye seek is not here. At At that time he was no longer there, because human beings had first to find their way through tradition and through scripture before reaching knowledge of their own concerning the mystery of Golgotha. Today neither scripture nor tradition tell us those things that need to be known. Direct knowledge alone can reveal them. We must work to bring about a time when the angel can answer, He whom ye seek is here indeed. But that will not be until the anti-Christian impulses of our time are cast aside. Paul wished to found a community filled with the consciousness that immortality is assured to man beyond death. In Christo morimur. In Christ we pass through death. Not until it is realized that spiritual knowledge alone can lead to an understanding of what Paul wished to establish will any improvement in the social sphere be possible. There can only be decline. The important thing to understand is that nowadays we must find spiritual knowledge through effort and education, whereas in ancient times it was our birthright. In light of these thoughts, the gravity of the present time comes vividly before us. Above all, the need to work for the spiritualizing of our civilization. 
must the bridge leading to the spiritual world, into which, after all, we enter when we pass through the gate of death, and in which we sojourn between death and a new birth, be utterly demolished? This bridge is broken by nationalism and by false socialism. And it is such tendencies which are at the root of all the urgent and fundamental crises of our time. Those who cannot realize this, who want to perpetuate a consciousness that is merely the outcome of material processes in the human being, are lending all their forces to the continuing growth of decadence. The time has come when these issues must be decided, and they can be decided only by human free will. Free will itself, however, is possible only when founded upon a real knowledge of the Spirit. At the time of the mystery of Golgotha, remarkable tolerance toward all faiths was practiced in Rome. Little by little people even brought themselves to exercise a certain tolerance toward Judaism. There was great tolerance in Rome in the days when the impulse of the mystery of Golgotha was finding its way into the evolution of humanity. Toward the Christians alone did intolerance become more and more vehement. There developed in Rome an intolerance toward the Christians as great as the intolerance now prevailing between different nationalities. Nationalism has its prototype in the intolerance of the Romans toward a genuine knowledge of the Spirit, which nowadays also meets with opposition on all sides. There are alliances today, often unnoticed, between Jesuitism and extremist elements of various kinds. For in the repudiation of spiritual knowledge, the ultra-radical communists and the Jesuits are completely at one. That too is reminiscent of the intolerance of the Roman state toward Christianity, and then as now, the fundamental impulse is the same. In the unconscious part of their being, people hate the spirit. Yes, actually hate the spirit. This unconscious hatred of the spirit confronts us in nationalism as well as in false socialism. For think what this hatred of the spirit means today, what nationalism means today. In ancient times, nationalism had its good purpose, because knowledge of the spirit was connected with the blood. But to be swayed by nationalistic passions as people are swayed today is completely senseless, because blood relationship is no longer a factor of any real significance. The factor of blood relationship, as expressed in nationalism, is a pure fiction, an illusion. For this reason, people who cling to such ideas have no right to celebrate an Easter festival. To celebrate an Easter festival is, for them, a lie. The truth would consist in the angel again being able to say, or rather to say for the first time, quote, He whom ye seek is here indeed. Close quote. But of this we may be sure. His presence will be vouchsafed only where the principle of the universally human takes effect. It is today as it was among the Romans, who showed the greatest intolerance of all to the Christians. What were all others doing apart from the Christians? The others were still venerating the Roman emperor as a god, were also making sacrifices to him. The Christians could do no such thing. The only king whom the Christians could acknowledge was the representative of universal humanity, Christ Jesus. This is one of the points from which one can trace a direct line right up to the present time. One has only to think of it as follows. Does the formula, quote, in the name of His Majesty the King, close quote, which appears on every ministerial decree, really mean anything to individuals in England, for example? If the truth, as demanded by the Spirit, were to prevail, such a formula would simply not be there. And how, I ask you, are the interests of a true Frenchman today, furthered by Clemenceau's nationalism, with its inner untruthfulness? It would be Christian to acknowledge such things in our times, but such acknowledgement would at once be the target of intolerance. These are the domains where untruthfulness is rampant, 
deep down in the souls of human beings. And this untruthfulness makes the other stones of nationalism and false socialism into one stone which is rolled upon the grave and covers it. The grave will remain covered until people again acquire a true knowledge of the Spirit, and through this knowledge, an understanding of universal Christianity. Until then, there can be no true Easter festival. Until then, the black of mourning cannot with integrity be replaced by the red of Easter. For until then, this replacement is a human lie. Humanity must seek for the Spirit. That and that alone can give meaning to present existence. Those who understand the evolution of mankind up until our own time will also rightly understand the words, quote, My kingdom is not of this world. Close quote. If the future is to contain hope, what must be striven for cannot be of this world. But that, of course, runs counter to man's love of ease. It is more convenient to set up old customs as ideals and then to bask in the glow of self-congratulation. This is far pleasanter than to say, quote, the great responsibility for the future must be shouldered. And this can be done only when striving for spiritual knowledge becomes a driving force in mankind, close quote. Therefore, Easter today must remain a festival of warning rather than one of joy. And those whose concern for mankind is deep and true will not use the Easter words, quote, Christ is risen, close quote, but rather, quote, Christ shall and must arise, close quote.